Location quality graphics for scientists is the topic that we're going to discuss today. Um, sounds like everyone can hear me. Hopefully you can see me as well. We are uh, really excited about this presentation because uh, doing publication quality graphics is one of the things that I think Datagraph does really, really well and really has the ability to save you time and make your life a lot easier. I was at a conference a couple of years ago and I spoke to someone who had a student that they were telling me had a graph they needed to create where they were connecting all these different lines and they spent a month creating this graph using PowerPoint. Um, I hate to hear stories like that because it just seems like a real waste of time. So, so uh, we're not going to create necessarily that exact graph, but I have a lot of examples for you today and to talk about how to make graphs that are not only uh, clean looking and nice looking, but are very much data driven so that if you change your data, you don't have to spend another month making your graph, you can go ahead and just plop in your new data and your graph will update. So one of the things I did to prepare for this presentation is to go online and to look and see um, what some of the types of graphs that people are already producing. There's Datagraph has been out for a number of years. So obviously there's a lot of publications that have used Datagraph for their graphics. And this is one that was published, let's see, this is in 2017. This is from uh, Nature Scientific Reports. This is an open access journal. And, uh, and there, there are several articles over the years that people have published using Datagraph. And this one is sort of interesting because uh, it, it's, you know, some box plots here. We have box plots on this axis also where the axis is tied to be together. And we're also combining images with this, with this graphic. So nice looking, clean graphic. Let me show you another one. Here's a graph also again from scientific reports and contains a lot of different elements. You can see that there is a histogram down below. We have a line overlaying that histogram, a smoothed version of the data. We have other line styles that are shown. These graphs also contain this points distribution, which is sort of interesting, kind of combining the histogram as well as the individual points. And then the last one that I want to show you, this was very recently published, uh, came out actually in May of 2020. This is a really interesting looking figure. Um, and they're using a, a combination of things here, right? They have this map, we have what we refer to as spider graphs. There's a template for this within data graph and all these elements are combined. So this was kind of interesting for me, just finding these three examples I thought was very inspiring because they really highlighted what does it mean to be a graph in a scientific publication. And to summarize what I got out of this was the aspect of these graphs being very unique, very clean looking, and the fact that they contain multiple types of graphs. These are not graphics that you would go and find in a spreadsheet program. I think we can all recognize when a graph is made in Excel, you see the colors, you see the look of a graph. These graphs all look very unique. And this is one of the things that uh, data graph, the approach that we use allows you to create very unique graphics. They're also very clean looking. Um, and again, combining these multiple types, allowing you to have images as well as graphics within the same, you know, same figure is something that you can do within data graph. Now, certainly people take graphs from data graph and they'll bring them into other programs and they may combine them. But one of the things that we want to show you is how you take an individual graph and you compose those graphs within data graph so that you can really go from a, a, a raw set of data to a final publication quality graphic all within the same place. Another thing that we want to emphasize with, with data graph is that the process of how you create the graph we think is very important. This is something that I think you hear more and more about, the ability to reproduce graphics um, and our analyses, that they're well documented and also that they're data driven. So the example of someone drawing all these different lines in PowerPoint and trying to line up numerical values so that they look appropriate, that is not uh, a data driven type of approach at all. That's very much manual 
and would be really hard to reproduce and also very hard to detect errors in something like that. Um, so the process of creating the graph is something that also, as you go through making the graph, um, in some sense, part of it is even self-documenting. And I wanna show you an example of that. So first, what I would like to do is we're going to go through each of these graphs that you see here, and I'm going to show you some similar examples and, and walk through how you would create something like this, where you have the, the box plots, um, another graph like this, where we're combining different elements. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about these spider graphs. And then I have some other examples for you as well. But this is where we're going to start and showing you how to build these graphics within data graph. I'm going to escape the presentation mode. And just give me a moment to reorient myself here. Here we go. So, so right now, this is actually the file that I was showing you. I've, I've mentioned a couple of times that we have this presentation mode in data graph. So all of the images that I just showed you are all images that I've actually copy and pasted or taken screenshots of and put within this data graph file. So if you haven't uh, considered doing presentations from data graph, you might want to. It's under the view menu and there's a presentation option there also described on our website. So what we're going to focus on now are the, are, the, are the graphics here. So first of all, again, box plots. Um, these, are, these are sort of getting a lot more popularity recently. There, someone actually recently sent me an article about how in the biological sciences in particular, the need for getting away from doing a standard bar graph with an error bar on it and to try and use graphics and statistical uh, descriptive methods that show you a whole distribution of data without um, giving you more information than a bar graph would do. So to, so to start, what I'm going to do is actually make use of the online examples within data graph. If you go under file, online examples, we have this window that pops up where you can search and find different graphs here. So for example, if you were going to make some box plots, if we search, search on the word box, there's a number of different box plots that come up and other types of graphs that are made using this box command. Violin plots are an example. They're made using the box command. It's a, it's a similar type of technique. It's not technically a box plot, but these are also gaining a lot of popularity. Any of these files you're interested in, you click on open, and then the file downloads to your computer and opens up. So this file that I have open now, let me go ahead and full screen this a little bit. We have three different plots in this actually, three different graphs. The first graph shows you a standard bar graph with error bars on that. The second graph combines that with an overlay of a points distribution of the data that's used. And the third graph takes away the bar graph entirely and uses the box plot instead. Um, and, and, and this was sort of an illustration of how different the information looks when you go from this type of view of the, of the bar graphs to this type of representation with the box plots. Um, so just that, that was one of the reasons I created this file. So I want to show you a couple of things here. First of all, notice the data is in two, uh, two columns. There's one column that has the category. There's another column that has the value. So these are, are two distributions of data. If I want to create the box plots, it's very easy to add a new graph. Um, if I just click the column of numerical values themselves and click on the box command, then you get a single box because it's taking all the data and putting it into this one command there. If you want to group it by category, then I can highlight both of these columns at the same time, hit box, and you'll see that the, the program is picking up that text column on the left-hand side and grouping the data accordingly. One of the points that I wanna make for you as you're making graphics within data graph is that the, um, the axis that you see is very much, uh, is always going to be a numerical axis underlying that. Even though you see an A and a B here, you see these categories, make this a darker color to make sure that you can see this. Oh, actually my color is set here. Go ahead and 
and change this to my pen color. There we go. So hopefully you can see that better at home. So, so, the, so the axis itself here says A or B, but really these boxes are also on a numerical axis. This is a categorical axis. Let me just prove this to you by adding a point in, in on the XY system. So I added a points command where I can just specify a location where I'd like a single point. Let me increase the point there. And I'll put this at um, an, a y value of 200, and we can make this an x value of 1.5 because that's in between my two boxes. And if I take away the um, position option and just say, um, oh, actually, let me do this a little bit differently. Now you can see the numerical axis. Uh, the way that I wanted to do this was by showing you if I create a column that has this, that's a numerical location, and I can make this a, to fill this in, I need this to be a text column, and then we can use this functionality of right-clicking, select fill empty rows with previous non-empty rows. Now my position, this can be my um, location here, let's make this, turn this back into a number column, have this be my position, now you see the data organized according to these two boxes and it shows you the numerical axis down below. Um, and the point is going to be in the same location whether we change this grouping based on a numerical value or we make this based on a categorical value. The, at, the look of the axis changes. Notice how the, 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 you have the small lines in between each of these boxes, but the location of the boxes is the same. So when you're combining um, different bar graphs and line graphs, for example, it's just something to be aware of that the categorical values that you'd see for a side-by-side -side bar graph, for example, made with the bars command, still has a numerical location underlying. I wanted to check and see, there's one question on the um, Q&A. Um, how do you decide what size you need to use for your graph? in case you, in, in this case, and there's the, the value that you see there, there was a certain size that I've used on the presentation before. So the question was, if you look at my presentation here, I picked a specific size. Um, so for those of you who, you know, might be, people might, uh, uh, on the line might be at some different levels here. This is, this location within what we call the canvas settings, this is where we set the size of the graph. Um, when I'm doing presentations, I, I tend to pick, um, I tend to use the pixel representation. So I could change this to 600 pixels by 600 pixels. Now my image isn't going to fit there. Um, in this case, I actually have spe a specific size of my underlying image. I think the first one I pasted in actually was the image here. And you can see that the image actually has this size of, um, you know, it's around 900 pixels high by around 1200 pixels wide. So I used that when I set up the, the size actually was what I based it on. Um, and going into presentation mode, it will scale your images appropriately for whatever screen you're using. So you don't have to actually worry about it too much as long as your image is going to fit within that area. Um, the size is here. I just changed them a little bit to have more of a presentation look to them in terms of the, the orientation. But I guess the, in, that, in this case, there's no specific reason why I'm picking, uh, picking one size other than it was to fit my, um, fit the, the image in there. Now, when we're doing publication quality graphs and you're going to be uh, making something for publication, setting the size to as close as you can, the output size that you really want the image to be is really important because we're, um, it helps you to make sure you're scaling everything appropriately. On my screen right now, this looks fine, but this is actually 16 point. That would be a very large point size for a publication. If I change my size here to specified, and now I show five inches by three inches, if you go to the, there's a zoom menu just right of that where you can say actual, and you see on your screen, what five inches by three inches will look like exactly in a printed version. 
in the uh, last webinar in June, we're going to talk about exporting graphics. So I'm not going to go into detail about that here. But now you can see that, yes, yeah, 16 point is way too big for this. If I made this 10 point, this looks much more appropriate for a, a publication quality graph. And I can change these sizes. Again, I know some of you are probably very familiar with this, but I want to make sure everyone is aware of this because this is such a handy thing to do. I can make the size of my graph um, exact based on units that I'm interested in. So here, this may be a little too big, uh, but I could make this 10 centimeters by um, eight centimeters. That may be an appropriate size for my graph. And once I have sizes that I'm happy with in terms of wanting to use them over and over again, just to the right, there's a gear menu where you can create your own custom size menu. You can add a size to the menu, remove sizes, and then that size of a graph will be there um, in, the, in, in the future. Ah, can you repeat um, where should I go to fill in the blank rows? Yeah, this is a really handy functionality. So for example, this column here, the category AB, um, if I just to recreate exactly what this category is like, I'll make a new text column. And the first place where I want an A, I can type an A, where I want B to be located, the start of that data, I can type B. And um, one of the reasons we added this functionality is because when you're taking data from uh, data files that people have prepared in spreadsheets, for example, it's very common that what people will do is they'll make their spreadsheet data look more like the table that you would show for the publication itself or for a presentation view. That's not necessarily what we want from a data organization and analysis perspective. So, so this kind of uh, situation is not uncommon at all. So when you want to fill in you can just um, do a, you know, I have my touchpad, so I'm using two fingers on the touchpad or a control click on that column. And the option is fill empty rows with previous non-empty row, and it will just fill in all that data. Actually, this, this data file had, had rows in it that don't, don't have anything in them, so I can just delete that. But now you can see how that works. So that's a really um, handy, handy functionality. I know I've used that a lot. Okay, so now you see that we have this graph, we've specified a size to this, but let's look back for a moment at the, the image that we saw here, because I want to um, point out a couple of things. One of the things is that you'll notice that this graphic, this, this box plot has lines located at specific points. And actually what, I, what I'd like to do for this is, let me, let me demonstrate that with a different file. There was another, um, box in Whisker that I wanted to open from the online examples. And it's this one right here. So this is a box in Whisper, Whisker graph that has uh, two different uh, graph sections to it. If I open this one up, then you can see I have my data here. This is a little bit more of a complicated file but I have a split view where the y-axis has been split to include both of these uh, sets of data with these box plots. And say I wanted to put a line in between for every other set of boxes here to have some additional organization. First, I would probably, again, if I'm gonna use this in a publication, make a specified, uh, uh, size for this so that it would be something closer to what I would be doing on output. Maybe this font is a little big, usually 10 point or 8 point even uh, um, would be appropriate for publications. Maybe I want this to be a uh, Times font or, uh, or again can change that font. But in terms of drawing the actual lines, this is the kind of thing that I think I know in the past I would take an image and bring it into another program, possibly like a PowerPoint, and draw lines and other types of annotations. But all of those options are actually very much available within Datagraph. And again, it's very data driven. There's a command called the lines command. You can see the icon shows lines being drawn at different heights. But you can use this to, to uh, not just for data, but we can use this for formatting of our image where I would go ahead and click on that command to add the lines command. I've added that now to my list. 
um, I don't really see anything because the line is drawn at zero. It's all the way to the left. Let me change this and draw it at, at one. And again, you can see that this box plot is at the, at the um, x equal to one location. Um, if I put it at two, it's gonna be the next one. So I can just go ahead and put it at, um, well, actually I wanna do 2.5 to put this line in between. And if you want that line to go across both axes, that's an option that's been added because again, this is something that uh, someone needed. So we have this line that now can go all the way across. And if I want a line at more than 2.5, I can go ahead and uh, put a comma. This is a comma separated list of values. So it makes it really quick to add in a, an individual line at a particular location. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and close out, great. So, uh, so again, a really you know, a handy way to be able to do this I can um, change the color of this line if I would like to, uh, maybe this isn't exactly what I do in my publication, but maybe we can do color and a lot more in publications than we used to be able to do. And what if I wanted to also have a line here that separated going across my graph? I could take my line lines command and I don't always need to start from scratch. This is one of the eight great things about, about using data graph. I can just make a copy of this command you can do command C, command V, or my favorite is just to click on a command, hold down the option key and drag, and that clones the command for you. Um, I would want this to now be at my Y, at a Y location, but it's going to be now along the Y axis at a specific location here. So first, one of the things actually I wanna do to create the look of the graph that I'm going for is I want to, um, uh, have, well actually do one thing, one thing at a time. I want to remove the separation between these two split axes. Um, and I can, I can demonstrate more split axis if, if people aren't familiar with that, but this is basically has been split here on the um, settings, the canvas settings, there are buttons here to split the axes. And when you do that, you get a graphic on the right-hand side of every command that allows you to uh, interactively change where that command is drawing their data. So um, when you also split the axis, you get a little box, another object that represents that split axis. And there's a space below that I can change to none. Now my graphs are right up against each other. I can, if I want this blue line to be right in between the two, I could say, okay, we'll place this at 80. I tested that before, and that was the location of the, the, the top of the line. But what that also does is the way data graph works by default is that adds a little bit of padding into the y-axis um, because it's, cons it's looking at that as data. It thinks that you wanna probably pad it a little bit. Again, we have an option to exclude the lines command from the range because people often use this, again, more for design than actually data itself. You can use it for both. Uh, but if I exclude from range, now my, um, my line that I drew isn't affecting the range of the data, and I have this nice panel of graphs that I've created. Okay, so just checking to see if there's any other, any other questions. Um, talk about the extra axis and the convert option. Ah, that's an interesting, okay, so there's a question here about the extra axis and uh, how do you convert the, um, the, how you can convert the axis that you see on the screen. So the extra axis, uh, let me just, sh I'll sh demonstrate just very quickly, this might be sort of an odd example, but let me use, I'll use the graph that you see here. Let me increase the, the range that you see. So one thing that's really common that people like to do is to see a second axis with different units or maybe just change the units on your axis without having to, um, without having to recalculate everything. So uh, one of the things that we do is we have this command called the extra axis command. Um, you can use this in different ways. It can be an extra axis, it can be kind of a custom axis, um, but for, for what I'm going to do here is I'll change this to being on the y-axis. It shows it inside the graph by default because we want you to know it's there once you've created it. But I could um, move it to the, 
uh, let's see, to the left, and then I can shift it. I can shift my axis so I could see both of them. And then if I wanted to see different units, you can um, convert the, the units that you see there by just typing in a conversion factor. Um, so th this is a very handy tool, again, for allowing you to, you don't, you're not having to mess with your data or recalculate things in your data, you're just displaying a different scale. You can also, there's options for temperature. Um, if you have a, an axis that's temperature, I can change the units and do that automatically without having to actually do that calculation. Um, and, and so all of these options are, again, a lot of this co has come out of things that people needed, things that we were interested in doing. You know, if there's other units that are of interest, um, one of the questions we had recently was about a reciprocal axis, which can actually be a little bit tricky. There are some templates on the uh, on the online examples that talk about how to do a, a reciprocal axis, if that's what you're what you're needing to do. Okay, so um, so let me keep going because I wanted to continue. Let me just see if there are. Oh, one of the things actually that I did want to talk about here before I go to my next example, is the fact that Datagraph has this option for using variables. Um, and one of the things I know I do a lot is I use variables, not just in calculations, but I use variables in the formatting of the data itself. So say I decided I wanted this graphic instead of as box plots, I wanted to do a violin type of a graphic. I wouldn't need to start from scratch. You can very easily pick a graph and there's a cloning button. So uh, there's a little plus button to make a new graphic, but right above that is a button to clone the graph. So I've created a brand new version of this that now I can change in any way that I want. Um, I'm going to also switch my view a little bit here to put my um, my commands on the left hand side. So this this small swap button on the bottom left corner allows me to put my commands on the left. So I'm not dealing with my data. This just gives me more room to work. And if I open up both of my commands, you can see that I have options here in terms of um, things like, for example, the width of my box plot. So say I wanted to change this width um, I, I have two locations for this. This would be something I might make a variable out of. But what I really wanted to show you again was the um, violin plots. So if I change this to a violin, and violins have these different options here, you could change the width, you can change the, there we go. So we can adjust all these values. But if I have two different data sets, I would really want those values to be consistent between the two of them. So this would be one place where I could, instead of setting each one individually, I can go ahead and go into my um, definition list and create a variable that would represent some of these values. So for example, I can even make this a, uh, a slider. If I wanted my window to go from one to two, um, and I would call that my window, um, whoops. I can go ahead and use that slider variable now in my graphs. And you can see, maybe this isn't a great example showing how they change, but it is making sure that these are set up exactly the same. The width may be a little more meaningful in terms of seeing how this changes so that you, you can appropriately see these values. So let me go ahead and again, I don't need to start from scratch. I can command um, or option drag this, create another copy of this variable. It's going to uh, give me a little bit of an error because I can't have two variables with the same name. So if I make this my um, width, for example, now I have a new variable, things come back. I can go ahead and put my width variable in here. And now when I change this, I'm going to change both at the same time. The last one here is this max setting. Let me go ahead and increase my, whoops. Increase my value here. Make another option. So setting this up takes a little bit of time. But once we do that, 
then we have now these um, variables that allow us to have multiple commands that are all going to have the same exact um, settings on them. So I can change these both together at the same time. Anyway, this, this is just to get you a sense of how you do this, that you're able to, um, again, use the variables not just in your calculations, but use them in actually creating the graphs and formatting the graphs and making sure that your graphs are appropriately created because things like uh, histograms, we'll talk about those in a moment. You know, you, you would want to make sure you use the same bin size across multiple histograms rather than changing that in individual commands. I can change that with variables here. Now, oftentimes what I do is I'll create one box plot using the variables and then just make a copy of that and change the data that then you're not having to constantly uh, update from, again, from scratch what the various settings are. So hopefully this has helped you see uh, some, some idea of how that works. I'm going to check on, the, see if there are any other on the Q&A. Um, we also, we do have someone who's on our, uh, on our, someone on our team who's also helping to answer questions if you're on the chat window or on the Q&A. So let's go ahead and move on now to another example. And the next one that I wanted to talk a little bit about is uh, think about how you would create a figure like this. Again, where you, where you are overlaying these multiple types of commands. Again, you'd never, you wouldn't find a template that creates something exactly like this, but you could tease apart the, the, the different components of this and create this within Datagraph. I'm going to start by opening up a, an example file that has histograms in it. So I can go to my example files, type in histograms, and yeah, see, the one I wanted to open up is this one called stacked histograms. You can see there's a number of, of different things that come up when you look at histograms. Again, all pretty unique. If I open this up, I can see that this file is it's relatively simple. There's three columns of data. I have my um, three histograms here. This, at this point, really doesn't look like a, you know, real publication quality type of a graphic. It's nice looking histograms. It demonstrates how this works. But again, if we wanted to have this be more suitable for publication, uh, there's a number of things that I would do here. First of all, uh, it's very handy to change the box style when you have these split graphs, depending on what you want it to look like. You can right click on the graph itself and change the box style to um, axis boxes. Now you see a box around each graph that you have. Um, that's a really handy thing to be able to do. Now another thing here is again, I may want to change my bin size. Uh, right now these are set to automatic, but if I change this to be based on different bins, now I, again, I have this place where I can use a variable. I can set a slider, I might want to test this a little bit here with the built-in slider to see what type of a, um, a bin size is what I'm going for here. And this looks like a relatively small one. Um, actually, just to show you, I don't have to use a slider. I can also just type in a value if I wanted this to be 0. Point, what do I have here? 0 0.1 for each one of my um, for each one of my histograms. I could go ahead and make that a variable and put that now in all of my histograms. That now, you know, is, is uh, more like what I'm looking for. And then if I want to change my bin size, I can change all three at once. And, and I know that I'm consistent between all of these. I may also want to even show what the bin size is on the graph itself. You can do that. Anything that you have as a variable, you can display in a text element on your screen. Um, there's a number of different annotation type of commands that are available. If you click on the text command as one of them, here we added it and it added it down um, on the bottom of my screen. I can go ahead, put this as a title of my figure. Um, go ahead and increase the font there a little bit. 
Um, I might want to scale this larger than the rest of the font that's in my figure. And now if I want this to be centered, um, I guess one of the things I, that uh, we really should talk about too is the, the way that these different elements are located within our actual graph because elements are either going to be located based on our XY coordinate system within the graph, but data graph gives you a lot of control over where things go like text labels and the text labels there are some options for locating them according to XY, XY locations, uh, but often we want to locate them more in terms of a, something relative to a particular corner or a particular side. So for example, here, this is anchored in the center of my graph. It's a, it's a title and it's a, also aligned in the center. So that's why you see this text located where it is. I could also change an offset and, and I'm changing that in pixels. So if I want a, a 10 pixel offset, I can just type that in um, and that's how it's oriented. So if I wanted to go back and recreate a graph that looked exactly the same with the exact same offset, I can do that. I can recreate that if I need to. Um, let me go ahead and actually, because if we were doing this for publication, I would size this and then you'd see, oh, this, this font is much bigger than I probably want for my graph that I'm going to, um, I'm going to output. Um, yeah, it still is pretty big. I'd probably go ahead and change that down to uh, a much smaller size. Okay, but the, what, I was, what I was really getting to is how do I display this bin size on my graph itself? Well, this is something that I can add via a token. Um, anywhere you see a text field, you can click, there's a little plus button to the right that I can click and I have this variable size that I can place that on my graph. So I could say my bin size, I can add just a text string along with my token. And now as I change my bin size, you can see the number changing on my screen as well as um, in the graph itself. The tokens also have the ability to allow you to do formatting within them. If I wanted this token to have a certain number of decimals, you can click on the token itself and there's a menu that gives you some options. If I only wanted to show, um, let's see, here we go, two decimals. Oh, well, that, that's one thing that gets me sometimes with the tokens. Everything in data graph is so instant, but the tokens do require you to hit enter. That's maybe one of the only places where if you don't hit enter, the change is not applied. So again, if I uh, wanna change this and hit enter, then you'll see the, the different decimals uh, change for the tokens, but still, uh, linked live to my, um, to, my, to my data here. Okay, so the, the other thing I just wanted to show you quickly, uh, making sure I get through, through the rest of some of the examples that I have, is to show you how would I put a line on this also. Because one of the things that we do is we really, you know, um, encourage again this, this view of data graph as, a, as not just a graphing environment, but an environment where you can do calculations and you can um, have everything set up in, in a pipeline so that you only change your raw data and everything else will update. So for the histogram, for example, I could click on this gear menu and there are options for extracting the data that's being calculated to display this histogram. I can extract as a column this location and I can extract as a column the value. So now I see both of these um, columns that I can then use in another command in order to show, let me um, make this maybe a different color, in order to show that. And if I do something like change my bin size now, I'm gonna change everything. So I'm changing the line, I'm changing the histograms, everything is connected uh, through these commands. So it's only my underlying data is what's being input and my, my final output all looks the same. We also have options that allow you to create the graph more as you saw it in that publication. I can take away the lines. Instead of this being a gradient, I can make this a solid fill and I could um, go ahead and change the color here to being more of a grayscale type of a color. Um, so a lot of different ways that we can combine these and, and I could use this um, 
I could now take this output data, I could integrate under that data, I could do all sorts of other things with it. Um, just checking to see if there's anything else looks like we're, we're doing uh, pretty good here. So, so we've talked about um, how we, we talked about the box commands, we, we've talked about overlaying lines, exporting data, I guess just to, just to not exporting data, but uh, extracting data from our commands. When you extract the data from the commands, that creates these columns. Notice how the, I did this initially by clicking on the gear menu and using these extract as variables. You can do that, extract as column, I can do that. Um, if you uh, prefer to do that, you can, you, can, you, you can extract the data using the gear menu, but when these columns are created, these objects that represent this output, these can also be copy and pasted. If I've done this now for um, this, first, this first set, I can go ahead and, and make put this in a group and I can clone this entire group, just click it, option drag. Now I wanna do this for Y2. And if I open up each of these, um, each of these objects, these are actually something you can also get from the menu to create from scratch. This would be the from command type of column. So it's telling you what command you extracting this from. Now I want this to be from Y2 and it goes ahead and will just um, extract that data for you. So I can do the same thing here again. I can click and drag and make a third one. And once it's connected, then I have those values being output for each one of my um, of my data sets. And when I do that, another thing that's really handy is that I've created this red line already. Well, again, the process, I can just create a couple of these, place them at my different locations, but in order to update the data that's being used for that particular command, you don't have to always go into the menus to select them, you certainly could. Um, one thing that's really important too that I wanna make sure that I do, do comment on is this idea of, the, of clients and suppliers. Because if I created this command and I'm wondering, well, where did, where did this data come from? I can just click on the, the menu and it will show me, for example, this command is still based on Y1. I wanna change it to be based on Y2. I'd like to do the same thing here. And now if I go under my gear menu, you'll see that there is a supplier entry and it will sh also show you exactly where all of this data comes from. And it will go all the way back, not just, it shows you everything that's being used for this command. Uh, really handy for auditing what you've done and for coming back to files later to see what data you used and where you used it. Um, okay, but the last thing I wanted to show you here was this idea of updating the data, not just by changing the menus, but you can drag and drop a group of data onto a command to have all that data update. And this will work as long as the column menu names are the same in both data sets. So here, as I created these, these, are, these have the same exact structure, but they have different data in them. So I wanna take this Y3 data and drag it and drop it onto this command and that updated the menu selection for that lines command. So, so even if you're creating a lot of these in a lot of different lines, um, because you can do all this drag and drop and do replacement, it can make it very quick to be able to create these things. And again, then using the ability to check where what's supplying this particular command, I can go in and double check that, yes, I'm using Y3 for that line to draw that data. So let me um, go ahead and leave, we'll leave that one for the moment. Let me see if there's anything else that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, no, I think that that was, that was pretty good for that one. Now let me talk about a little bit about um, this graphic that you see here. And the graph that you see here is using this spider graph file that we have. Again, this is in the examples. 
And if I type on um, spider plot, then I get this graph that I can go ahead and click open and you'll see that. And um, just quickly, I wanted to show you again, how do I take the image that you see here and start to create something that looks like the one that you see on this graphic? Um, a couple of things. This, this file is set up more like a template. Our files are, are a combination of examples and templates. A lot of them are really meant more to be examples to show you how to make things, but some of the files are more template-like in that you would just plop in your own data and the graph should appropriately update as needed. For example, here, if I don't have quite so many uh, categories, I can click on a couple of these and go ahead and remove them, and then it changes the entire background that's um, being used for this graph. So, so it is uh, relatively flexible in terms of how you use this. And, um, and in here, what we have are groups of data, data one and data two. Um, what I'm actually gonna do here is I'm going to clone this uh, spider graph that you see, and Again, I want to change the data that's associated with this. And if we look at what's being drawn here, there's really two sets of uh, types of commands. There are commands that are drawing the grid itself because this is in polar coordinates. There's a number of calculations that are being done within the data table to create the polar grid. If I am not sure what a particular group of commands or command is drawing, I can always just hide it from view and then you can see clearly this, these commands are what's drawing the actual grid itself. Um, and then here you can tell by the icons what's drawing different aspects of this data. So for example, for this one, if I wanted to change my colors, I can expand my command. And one thing that I have found handy in doing design is that if I click my color tile um, using the color dropper, I actually am just gonna go right to the graph where we, uh, where we got the, 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 this file where it was created and I can use the color dropper in order to grab that color. Um, and then I could add some opacity into this to be able to change the color that you see there. Um, and there's the, the green color also actually. So now I have something that uh, looks, looks fairly different than what we started with, but much more like the graph that you see here, all using this um, sort of a template. Oh, but the, the, what I wanted to show you was again, in terms of replacing the data, that if I wanted to replace the data that's being used for this particular command, again, there's a second data set here that actually just wasn't being used, I can drag it and drop it and go ahead and replace that. So for this template or this file, you have for a given data set, let me just focus in on what's here. The data set has the value of the columns itself. And then there are two columns where we're calculating the X and Y coordinates where that would go to create this graph. So you can paste in your own data into one of these or you could bring in your own column, and then as long as your column name was the same, was value, then these equations can be copy and pasted into that, into an additional data group. So not hard to take these files and massage them to create the kind of graph that you would like to do for a publication. Now, one of the things that is really important that I wanna make sure that I talk about is how we compose graphs. So we can create all these different individual graphs. We can create these pipelines of analysis. So our data is being used from raw data to final publication, and then create these, again, com uh, compose all the graphs together into a final um, publication quality output. So I have a couple of examples here that are from, um, let's see, if this one, let me start, actually I'll start with this one. This is a graphic that I created um, that is sort of simple. I actually did not use box plots for this. This is, this is a bar graph showing a mean and a standard deviation. This is in some ways relatively simple, but there's a lot of components here. And one component is an image that was copy and pasted into this file, just a, a screenshot that was brought in. You can see the bar graph itself where 
In this case, I took away all the margins around the graph. You can still see the numbers. I'm not sure how well that comes through on the presentation. But if you go to the, the graph that you see to the right, this is a combination of the other two graphics. To create something like this, um, and actually maybe just to convince you, let's say I wanted to highlight um, some component within this graph. There are a number of commands to do that. Um, for example, if I wanted to draw a circle on the graph, there's a region command that I can add and I can change the width of this so that hopefully you can see this a little bit better. It added this oval here. I can change the size. Now, one thing about using um, graphics is that graphics don't have an XY coordinate system. So if I'm adding in other commands that do rely on some coordinate system to locate them like an oval, then it's really helpful to go ahead and, oops, not in the margins, but to go ahead and in the axis settings, create an axis. So put in include um, in X and include in Y some range. You could also just put those in the restrict settings too. So now the, the image you've created has a coordinate system. I'm not showing it here. You could. If I click draw X and Y numbers, you'll see what the coordinate system is. But now if I drag this around, um, it's just a bit easier to do that. One thing you can do is uh, maybe I don't want to drag my image, I can Command Z for that. The images themselves, if you open them up, there's an option for uh, unchecking, allow dragging. Makes me a little more efficient in case I, um, oops, in case I click the image by mistake. But I can go ahead and drag around my, um, my circle to get this in the right place. Now, one trick here that I've used is that by default, this region command doesn't have a fill. If you go ahead and add a fill, then I can go ahead and just drag the whole circle around. So that makes that a little bit easier. And then once I have it where I want it, I can remove the fill. And notice that I've done this in the individual image here, but when I go now to my image that's on this screen, you'll see that same, um, that same circle. And the reason is because we're, at, we're just including that graphic into this into this overall com uh, composite graph. To create a composite graph, what I can do is just, oops, actually I don't want to, I don't want to do it from there. That creates a standard graph with uh, margins around it and the X, Y axis showing. Go under the file menu and say new graph for composition. And when you do that, you'll see this completely blank screen. This really is not a different graph type. It's just a graph that is uh, set up in such a way that it doesn't have margins around the, where the X and Y numbers are and we're not drawing them. So it just makes it handy for combining graphs. Also by default, it will contain what we refer to as the graphic command. Um, that icon is up top. You can always add more of these. And the graphic command is one way to bring in to bring in images. Actually, just to show you really quickly, you can take anything on your screen, take a screenshot of it, and just click on the graph and do paste, command V, and that will paste in that image as a new graphic command. Very handy for taking screenshots. I do this all the time when I'm doing work and maybe there's some type of an equation or some other information that I want to document within my file, I can just go ahead and make a, a graph that's more for me to document my process and take screenshots and put them in there. Um, anyway, so for this, I can change the source here. There's a source option. And when you do that, you'll see if I set it to source graph, the other graphs within my file are things that I can see and I can click on this to go ahead and, ahead and combine these two graphs. Now to make this look like the one you see here, I had to do some work to set the margins um, and get these set up correctly, but it, it's not that difficult to do. The main thing is to, to take advantage of the anchoring of the graph instead of just uh, dragging things around. If I want this one on the left-hand side, I would want to um, anchor this to the left so that my offsets can make sense. So maybe I want to offset this 10 and 10. Um, same thing here, I want this to the right, but maybe 
uh, I would go ahead then and I could use the same offsets. Um, again, I would want to kind of uh, change this a little bit to make sure I get, get my sizes right, but hopefully you can see how I can pull this together to make my final graph. Actually, I would also want to specify the size on this. So right now my sizes don't make any sense. I can go ahead and increase these to something that would make sense for my final output, or I might find that I need to scale these down by about half of the size. And I could, as you can see, when I do that, I could then add in all sorts of other graphics to this and images, um, screenshots of things that I could put into this graph. And then what I usually do for something like this where I'm combining graphs is the actual label of the, of the graph. So this is a text command that I have labeling what is in this image and then another text command labeling what's in this image. And again, I have a lot of control over where things are located based on pixel offset so I can make sure that things line up exactly. Um, so I think that that looks, looks sort of nice. Um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and we'll check the time. We have, a, we have a few more minutes, not too much left, but there was another example here that I had that I thought was Oops, let me go ahead and open this one. Here we go. This is another one where you are combining these different graphs. I have three different graph types, and then I'm com combining this into one final graph. And this is um, not only using, uh, let me go ahead and reduce the, the size on this so that you can see this a little bit better. There we go. This is, utilizing a lot of different things. It's because the, the regressions are also being done. So um, obviously regression analysis is something that's very big in scientific applications and, and part, of the, part, of, part of the scientific method in terms of understanding relationships between variables. Here we have a graph where the regression, let's see, I can increase the size, oops, let me increase it even bigger for you here. So we have a regression of these two variables. There's an R square. It's actually sort of interesting data in that it's um, looking at the abundance of wolf versus moose on this particular island and um, the dynamics between the two of them. And you can see how they, how they change and there is a relationship between these two. Um, so so this, this regression has an R square value that is being used in my text label here. And, and as a result, if I changed any of my data, I'm actually um, a little hesitant to do this to see if, and I'm not, I'm not exactly sure which, which data I'm plotting here, so maybe I shouldn't, shouldn't change this. Um, well, actually, even better to use, this is what I would do, right? I would go to my suppliers for this, I want to open up my definition list so I can oops, so I can see my data. And if I want to see what data I am using for this regression, I go to my suppliers. I can um, actually no, let me use the suppliers from the regression. I could have, could have done it from the label too, but we'll go ahead and do this. So here, this is great. I mean, this is actually exactly what I wanted to illustrate that if, even if I don't remember, you know, I go back to this file months later, I don't remember what column I used to create this regression. It's really quick for me to go back into my data file and see what data did I use. So there's an aspect of this that's almost um, self-documenting. And for scientific applications and publications, I think this is so important. So if I now wanted to find this column, this is the one that it pointed to, I can click this arrow to go and get this exact column of data that's being used in this regression. So if I change one of the numbers on here and I just change it to something pretty dramatic to show you the impact, then I see that indeed this is the column of data that I'm using in that regression. So we are about out of time. I hope that this has been helpful for you. Um, I, I think that you know, there's a lot of different ways people use data graph and um, certainly basic graphing is one of them, but for creating these custom graphs and being comfortable with taking the templates and being able to modify them to create your own graphs, I think is, is really um, important. I see there were a number of, uh, of questions. I'm just gonna look really 
quick and see if um, if there's anything. Yeah, we talked about adding images, extra axis. So hopefully we got um, get most of this. There's one question that just popped up: how the um, text R squared changes without with changing the regression. So that's it, that that's because this text label is using a, the token. So the, the R squares themselves can be tokens. Let me just create one from scratch so that you can see it. So in case you miss that, um, I'm going to change this number. So now I've changed my R square, I've changed my data. Everything is connected to that underlying data set. When I created this um, text label, there we go. I can create a new one from scratch just so you can see this process. So here's my text label. And again, if I click on the plus symbol, you get a list of available variables. And uh, I'm glad you asked this question because it's not just limited to things that are in the variable list. Certain commands are also going to be in that list. So if you have a fit command, for example, and you're creating a text label, you can highlight that command and then you'll see a list of all of the different types of things that you can display that will come directly from that command. So for example, if I want to display the function, click enter, um, then you see the actual function there. Now I have the word text here is shown, so uh, that, <laughs> there we go. Um, again, now if I change my data, maybe I don't change it quite as dramatically. You can see that the R squared changed. You can see that my equation updated. Um, so this is really a great way to, again, make sure that everything is, is tied together appropriately. And if I have, um, actually there's one more, you know, we're right afternoon, but I'll just show you, for those of you who are able to stay for a moment, I'll show you one more example that I think illustrates this really nicely. So if you go and type in, um, regression, then there is a linear regression example here. Um, there's also a, one that uses a table um, that's really cute that I didn't really talk about, but it, it's using the points command to draw those points on the table to make a table-like interface on the graph. I'll, I'll leave that for you to maybe check out on your own, but this is a nice example because it further illustrates this idea that when you create a graph in the form that you like, you don't have to keep recreating it over again. Here's a regression where I've set up a text command to have all of these different goodness of fit parameters available. So I'm showing you the slope, the intercept, um, the error, the R square, the N, I've set up all of these. And so to do this once definitely took some time to get it to look the way that I wanted to. There's also an option for aligning the data that's in these commands. Um, I have this aligned via a token so that it looks, looks the way that I want it on the right hand side. But if I wanted to update this data, I can just go over to my group of data here on the left hand side, which is organized according to these three different groups. Right now I am drawing group B say I want to draw group A, I can take this group and drag it and drop it right onto that list of commands and everything updated, even the label that's on the, um, on the top of this graph updated with the label A uh, because that also is a token that's connected to, to this data. So I could bring this, bring this back again to bring back the B data. So there you can see it. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, uh, this video will be available after the presentation. We have been putting these on uh, on YouTube. Uh, I think we've been it's been taking us maybe till about Wednesday to get these posted. So we'll be posting this next week. Uh, we will continue to integrate these with our website a bit more. But for now, following us on YouTube is a great way to. Uh, make sure that you see those videos when they're posted and get get an update. Um, so I, I wish uh, all of you a great weekend. And um, oh, I do see that there was one other uh, example oh, question. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get to answer all of these. We'll, we'll we'll continue to do our best to get to your questions. 
Um, I think we did get to most of them and I hope that everyone has a great weekend and thanks so much for the positive feedback. Um, we will be continuing next week with a webinar where our focus is going to be talking about statistics and the methods by which we can do statistics within data graph. One of the things that I'm going to also show you in that presentation is the data graph R package because we don't intend for data graph to do every type of statistical test that's out there but we do want to make it easy for you to integrate data coming from other sources. So there's some things you can do in data graph, but other things you would be doing, say, in R. And with the R package, you can make a direct connection between output from R and input into data. So I'll show you that. That is something that's in the beta that you can test and use now. Um, but again, hope that you have a great weekend. And thanks so much for attending. I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar now.